lift our hands and praise the Lord. <laughs> we love you, Lord Jesus. And we praise you, Almighty God. Blessed be thy matchless holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Brother Tim. And praise the Lord, everyone. My, what an exciting meeting this has been throughout the entire weekend. I have thoroughly enjoyed all of it. Sometimes I go to anniversary services that I endure. <laughs> but this has genuinely been an enjoyable, enjoyable weekend. It is so nice to meet Mayor Moore and Mr. Sterren, who is, is hoping to be the future mayor, and I wish you blessings. Praise God. We want to thank them for the excellent and obvious leadership that they've already given to this wonderful city. And we pray God will just continue to bless them. When uh, Mayor Moore learned that I was from West Virginia, he wanted to know if I could walk straight. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I must walk straight. I will lose my job if I don't, and so will you if you don't walk straight. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. My nephew, he is in love with his computer, <laughs> and he finally convinced me to buy one the other day. He's trying to get me out of the horse and buggy stage. <laughs> he has one of these laptops, you know, that he carries with him everywhere. And he was gone three days and I sold it. <laughs> You're just going to have to take me horse and buggy style. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God bless you. I have a message for you today. We are so thankful and we are so proud of the history of this church. Today I want to challenge you for the future. As Brother Hamby, our distinguished, beloved elder, has said, it is not over yet and there is much more ahead to be accomplished. And I want to challenge you today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you'll turn with me to a text in the Scripture in the Old Testament, the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 6. We want to take our Scripture lesson from there and our Scripture illustration. 1 Samuel chapter 6, beginning with verse 7. Now therefore make a new cart... And take two milch kine, that means cows, on which there had come no yoke, and tie the kine to the cart, and bring their calves home from them, and take the ark of the Lord, and lay it upon a cart, and put the jewels of gold, which you return for him, a trespass offering, in a coffer by the side thereof, and send it away that it may go. And see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh. Then he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. And men did so, and took two melts kind, and tied them to the cart, and shut up their calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart, and the coffer of the mice of gold, and the images of their imrods, and the kind took the straight way. Would you say the straight way with me? And the kind took the straight way to the way of Beshemesh, and went along the highway, lowing as they went and turn not aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went out 
went after them unto the border of Beth And they of Beth were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the cart came into the field of Joshua of Eshemite and stood there where there was a great stone. And they clave the wood of the cart and offered the kine a burnt offering unto the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your precious people and all of our special guests that have gathered into this sanctuary today to love, to worship, and to honor you. And we thank you, Lord, for your holy presence. Now we ask, Almighty God, that you will anoint this congregation to receive the word of the Lord and to understand the word of the Lord. And I pray, Almighty God, that you shall anoint my mind and cause my mind to be alert and loose my tongue that I may speak to your people. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen and amen. Would you give him another hand praise unto the Lord? From this text, I want to speak to you on the subject, the reward of sacrifice. The reward of sacrifice. Let me give you just a little bit of background, what is happening here in the days of Israel, according to our text. Israel was a people that were up and down spiritually, depending on leadership. If they had good, strong spiritual leadership, they would rise to great heights of revival. Without that leadership, they would fall into the depths of sin. And even beyond that, they would fall into the depths of idolatry, which God despised and hated. Israel had fallen into one of those times of idolatry and had brought the displeasure of God, Jehovah, upon them. God allowed their enemies, the Philistians, to come in and literally steal the Ark of the Covenant away from them and to take it into their own country. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was a small piece of furniture that was very, very special unto the people. It had certain things in it that is of great interest, but I will not explain that nor take the time for that today. Let it, be, uh, let it be suffice that, uh, let me just say this to you, that the Ark of the Covenant was the very symbol of the presence of Almighty God among His people. God allowed that symbol to be taken away from them, showing that He had lifted His presence from them and His blessings from them. However... That Ark of the Covenant did not affect those idolatrous, idol-worshipping people in the same way that it did Israel. It brought to them the wrath of God. God did use them, but He also allowed His wrath to come upon them because His Ark was in their presence of their idol gods. And, and God allowed plagues to come unto them. It affected their fields and rodents. And pestilence came and began to destroy their crops. And not only that, it affected and afflicted their bodies. And they suffered in their bodies. And God allowed plagues to come unto them. It affected their fields, and rodents, and pestilence came and began to destroy their crops. And not only that, it affected and afflicted their bodies, and they suffered in their bodies. These men, though they were not Jehovah 
uh, worshiping of the true God, nevertheless, there were men that were very intelligent and very wise among them. That's what missionaries find out when they go to foreign countries, as I have done many times. You are going to discover even though a nation is poverty-stricken, and they may even be an idolatrous nation, such as Thailand. When I went to Thailand, there was over 80 million Buddhist idols in that nation. We lived in Bangkok, where there was 400 Buddhist temples in that one single city. But you're going to discover that in spite of their idolatry, there are those that are among them that are extremely brilliant and intelligent. I remember on one occasion when I was uh, debating the scriptures and this debating religious thoughts with a Buddhist uh, 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 celebrity among the Buddhist people in Bangkok. And quite frankly, he was out talking me. He was a real brilliant man. He was a real philosopher. But we have certain advantages they're not aware of. And that is an almighty God that lives within us who is able to help us. Can you say amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. And I finally said to him, I said, why don't we continue this conversation one week from today? And in the meantime, I want you to take an occasion to talk to my God. I knew that would make a lot of difference if I could get him to talk to my God. He said, I don't know how to talk to your God. I said, my God is so easy to talk to. And I explained to him how to talk to my God. And I met him one week later and started and was prepared to debate with him again. He said, oh, no, 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 no. That is not necessary. On a Wednesday night when I was ready to go to sleep, I sit down on the edge of my bed and I remembered my promise to you. I had already turned the lights out in the room. It was dark in the room. But you had explained to me that you could talk to your God even in the dark. And so I spoke those words that you told me. Oh, Jesus Christ, if you are truly living and if you are truly God and would do something in my life, somehow demonstrate yourself to me at this very moment. And he said, suddenly, my light, my room lit up as if it were lit with a fluorescent light. And I fell upon my face on the floor, worshiping your God. Praise be the name of the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. But there were those among them that were brilliant. And they determined that these plagues upon their fields and upon their bodies was because they had displeased the God Jehovah and had brought that ark into their presence. So they devised a very clever plan to get that ark back to Israel if indeed that was what had happened. So they chose two cows that had never plowed, that had never pulled a cart, that had never pulled a wagon, had never had a harness fastened upon them. And then they took a new cart, a wooden cart, and they hitched it up to those cows. Furthermore, they chose two cows that had little calves, and they took the little calves away from the cows and put them in the barn. And then they hitched up those cows to that cart and put the Ark of the Covenant on the cart, and then simply, without any direction, without anybody sitting on the cart, without anyone leading them, simply turned them loose. And the idea was, in when we turn them loose, if they go in the direction of Beshemesh or Israel, then we will know that God is displeased with us, and He wants the ark back into the presence of Israel. Now, I'm not a farmer. Brother Charlie's been a farmer. <laughs> and he would know what happened in such a situation as this. I don't know a lot about cows, but I know enough that when those calves were bawling over there in that barn for their mamas, what would have happened? When they would have turned them loose, those cows would have turned that cart upside down and rolled the cart out on the ground, and they would have headed right straight for that barn where those calves were at. 
But that is not what they did. They went in the direction of Beshemesh. You see, God had touched these cows. And these cows were no longer their own. God had touched their brain. God had touched their flesh. God had touched their blood and the sinews and the bones of their body. And they could no longer do the natural thing. But they had to do the supernatural thing and obey the commission of the Lord God Almighty. And that is the position that we are in today. We have been touched of God. We have been anointed of God. We are commissioned of God. And we can no longer do the natural thing. But we have to reach out to do the supernatural thing that God has commissioned us to do. Can you say praise the Lord? <laughs> Let's give him a hand praise unto the Lord. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I never shall forget when I was a young preacher and a young pastor and the Lord called me to the nation of Thailand. It was very miraculous the way the Lord spoke to Sister Cole and I, and I will not take the time to tell you how that all came about, but anyhow, we made our decision to go. I was pastoring a little church in a small village in the state of West Virginia, Spencer, West Virginia. It was just a little town of 5,000 people in the mountains. I mean real, genuine, rugged, sharp, high mountains. And the roads in those days were just uh, two-way roads, narrow roads. And I remember there was over 900 curves from my house to my father's house just 40 miles. <laughs> <laughs> and some of those curves was so sharp that you could see your own license plate as you was going around. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I had not been in foreign countries ever except uh, I had visited Canada. And really, Canada, if you've ever been there, some of you have, no doubt, it's not very foreign. But because of my upbringing and because of being uh, spending so much time in that particular area, I was not a traveler by any sense of the word. And though I had a good time in Canada for three months of evangelistic meetings, I was so happy when I came back across the border that I parked my car right by the flag and got out of my car, got down on my hands and knees and kissed the ground. <laughs> I am not, I was not, and am not a tourist, though I travel a great deal. <laughs> so I had little or no experience in traveling. But anyhow, the Foreign Missionary Board uh, passed us very quickly, and then the uh, General Board passed us very quickly, and we were on our way to the nation of Thailand. Back in those days, the Foreign Missionary Board made you go by ship. Thank God they've quit that. God bless all of you sailors. You can have them all. <laughs> I wouldn't want to go on a cruise if it was free. <laughs> the first day we were out, we got into a storm. And that great big old freighter, we was going so far, you know, Thailand is exactly halfway around the world. Right now, it is 11.30 a.m. here. In Bangkok, it is 11.30 p.m. It's exactly halfway around the world. You can go east or west, and it's the same distance to Bangkok. <laughs> and, and the only way you could get there in those days was by freighter. And so we was on a freighter. And the... And, and the only way you could get there in those days was by freighter. And so we was on a freighter. And the storm was so terrible that first day 
and that ship would rise like that, like it was going to turn over, and then it would come down, and when it would come down, it would go completely under the ocean. And when it would rise up, the water would roll off of the deck like Niagara Falls. It was tipping so much, one time I run up the wall and fell on the floor right on my back in my room. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Anyhow, we were on that ship for three weeks. We see nothing but water, 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 not even one island or one tree for three solid weeks. And then we were making a short stop in the Philippines. We first went into Subic Bay, which was a military base, been in the news quite a bit recently. And we went into Subic Bay, and Shirley was uh, much more of a tourist than I was, than I, than I was or am. And, uh, and she wanted to get off of that ship and go into the city around about. I was a nervous wreck. These, uh, so many of the people, apart from the Americans, were these little tiny Japanese people. And I had little or no experience with foreigners whatsoever. <laughs> and quite frankly, they made me very nervous. <laughs> Some missionary, eh? <laughs> and anyhow, we decided to get off, and, and, and she was having the time of her life. But finally I heard someone yelling at me, Billy, 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 Billy! And I was standing in the middle of the street, so mesmerized by everything that I was just looking like this. <laughs> I was just absolutely astounded and overwhelmed. Well, we got back on the ship, took a short trip down to the, the harbor in Manila. And there, uh, we was going to get off of the ship in the afternoon, and they ganged around us wanting to sell us black market money and everything else, and they made me a nervous rock. <laughs> and I told Shirley, I said, let's get back on the ship. She was submissive and obedient in those days. <laughs> Anyhow, about 11 o'clock at night, the missionaries showed up, and I, I was so green, I was so inexperienced, that it never even occurred to me to let the missionary know that we would be stopping in the Philippines. But my mother thought of it, and she had written to them and told them to watch for that particular ship and to try to greet us. Well, they came on the ship at 11 o'clock at night and got permission from the captain for us to go to their house, which was about uh, an hour's drive away to Angeles Papanga. And so... And we were so thrilled. I never was so happy to see anybody in all of my life as I was to see those missionaries. And, and the captain said, eh, since you're Americans and you'll only be gone one day and come back to the ship, you don't even need a visa. Just take your passport. You don't need a visa. So we took a little overnight kit with us. And oh, what a time we had. We talked the whole night until daylight, took a couple hours sleep, and then he took us out to some little shops to sightsee, and they had the most beautiful wood carvings you ever seen. Back in those days, missionaries were genuinely poor. I only had $700 with me on the ship to do, to reach a whole nation of people. <laughs> and we were so poor, but nevertheless, I was trying to be protective of that money. So I only took $10 with me to the missionaries home. And but I got carried away and spent nine of those dollars for a souvenir. <laughs> and, and so when we came back to the house in the afternoon, we decided, well, it's probably time we should call the captain and uh, check in with them. He had said he's going to be there three days. So when I called, all I could get was the agent on the, on the ground, on the land. He said, sir, that ship sailed this morning. I said, sailed? <laughs> and Brother Buck Miller jumped up and down and said, it's the will of God, it's the will of God. <laughs> and my wife was bawling and squalling. She was only 23 years old. <laughs> and, uh, and, and when she was able to get her breath, she finally said to him, you are as crazy as a bedbug. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, we went to the SAS Airlines and they agreed to let us have an air ticket to Bangkok on credit. Now, that don't sound like much now, but believe me, it was not done in those days. And they told me I could pay for my ticket when my ship came in. <laughs> However, that ship was not going to be arriving in Bangkok for quite a while. It had to go on to Vietnam and then to, to Bangkok. And, uh, and so the missionary said, we are having our very first general conference in the Philippines. We only had 200 members in those days in the entire nation. Today we have hundreds of thousands that have received this glorious truth. Can you say praise the Lord? <laughs> but back then there was only 200 in the whole nation baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, someone had just sent me a little direct offering that I can use for your air ticket down to the Negros Island. He told me, he said, now if we go to immigrations and explain this situation to them, they're going to tie you up into so much red tape and so much expense that you will not be able to go to the conference. He said, now you do not have a visa, but you let me handle everything. If anyone challenges you, you let me do the talking. I said, all right. <laughs> and I was terrified by all of this. <laughs> Anyhow, when we started to board this little DC-3 airplane with canvas seats on it, if you please, we started to get on. There was a what we would call an MP standing there, armed, and he was just getting everybody onto the plane, no problem. But when Shirley and I walked up there, and Brenda, being foreigners, he said, let me see your visa, please. And my heart fell right down into my shoes. But he had told me, don't say anything. So I didn't. And the missionary looked at that guy and said, Don't you know who these people are? And he snapped to attention and saluted us. <laughs> <laughs> and so at the camp, we learned so many things. We had 25 get the Holy Ghost in that meeting. Not because I was there. No, 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 I had nothing to do with it. I was just like this. <laughs> I was astounded at everything. <laughs> and finally we was on our way back, and uh, the missionary says, Now when you walk up to immigrations to leave today on your flight, they will probably arrest you. I said, Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> you cannot imagine how I was feeling. <laughs> Anyhow, when we walked up and handed our ticket and passports, uh, he was smiling and he was so nice. But when he opened my passport and there was no visa, the smile came off of his face. And when he looked at my wife and Brenda's uh, passport and no visa, a frown came on his face. He said, you've been in this nation eight days and you have no visa. I said, yes, sir. He said, you're under arrest. Don't you move more than ten steps from this counter. And believe me, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> and there was a man came along in a little while, very distinguished looking Filipino man dressed as I am here today. He had been on our ship from Subic Bay to Manila, having no idea who he was, because this man I tried to explain to the one that had arrested me, we have a ticket, we've got to get on that plane in just a couple of hours and go to Bangkok. And he had answered to me, impossible. There's only one man on this, in this country that can get you on that plane. And he is the invisible man. Now, I don't know what he meant by that. I suppose it meant that he's hard to find. I don't know what he meant, but that's what he said. man, I tried to explain to the one that had arrested me, we have a ticket, we've got to get on that plane in just a couple of hours and go to Bangkok. And he had answered to me, impossible. 
There's only one man on this, in this country that can get you on that plane, and he is the invisible man. Now, I don't know what he meant by that. I suppose it meant that he's hard to find. I don't know what he meant, but that's what he said. Anyhow, here come this distinguished-looking man that had been on our ship, and he hardly spoke to us. He did say hello. But he fell in love with Brenda. Brenda was only five years old. She had blonde hair and blue eyes and was extremely outgoing. She talked to everyone. And he and her had sit in chairs on the deck and had talked the entire trip to Manila. He loved Brenda. And when Brenda seen him, she run right straight to him in that airport. And he said, what are you people doing in the Philippines? Well, I had no idea it could help, but I explained to him. He reached, took the passports out of my hand, walked behind the desk, predated them eight days and stamped all three of them with a visa and said, get on the plane. He was the invisible man. <laughs> and when he did that, the guy that had arrested me looked at me and he said, Incredible! Incredible! And by this time I was feeling pretty cocky. <laughs> so I looked back to him and I said, Incredible! Incredible! Well, they had already taken away the stairs to the plane and they had to reopen the door and push the stairs up and get us on. And back in those days, everybody dressed sharp when they was flying on an airplane. Today, they look like they jump out of bed and wear their pajamas <laughs> to the airport. <laughs> but not, no, not then. But Shirley and I and Brenda were the first worldwide hippie travelers. I had no suit coat. I was wearing a sports shirt and the same pants for eight days. <laughs> <laughs> and she was wearing the same dress. We had washed it out every day. It used to be blue. I don't know what color it was by that time. Anyhow, we got on that plane, and we flew to Bangkok. And when we arrived in Bangkok, we held to the back of the line to be as inconspicuous as possible. <laughs> and so when we finally got up to immigrations and the authorities, they were dressed in white uniforms, sharp as they could be, brass on their hats and their shoulders, and they looked us up and down, and believe me, they were not impressed. <laughs> and finally, he said to me, where is your luggage? I said, right here, one little overnight kit. He said, how much money do you have to declare? I said, I have one dollar. I was too proud to tell the missionary I didn't have any money. And I only had one single dollar in my pocket. <laughs> and I didn't tell the missionary about it at all. He probably couldn't have done nothing about it anyway. <laughs> but anyhow, he said, just how long do you want to stay here? I said, four years. He said, I think we have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm going to give you a short tourist visa, and then you must go to immigrations and work this out. Well, I had baptized a man in the America who had a parochial school in the middle of Bangkok of over 2,000 students. But I couldn't even think of his name. I couldn't pronounce his name. His name was uh, Bunmark Gittisan Watanajan, and... Uh, I couldn't think of it, I couldn't spell it, and I didn't have a telephone number or anything. And Bangkok was a city of four million people. And I did not know where to go. We had no address, nothing. Everything was in the suitcase on the ship. And I told Shirley, I know he doesn't live here at this airport. And with the... <laughs> <laughs> and I had seen pictures of his parochial school. And so for one dollar, in those days, we could get on the shuttle bus for 50 cents each. And Brenda was young enough, she didn't have to pay. So we just had enough money. And they delivered all of the passengers to the hotels, you know. And, and the, little, the, the man that was driving the shuttle couldn't speak one single word of English, not one word. And the, and the tour guide... 
She could speak English, but not enough to understand my situation. She couldn't comprehend why I didn't tell her where to go and why I didn't get off of that bus. She couldn't comprehend it. I couldn't make her understand what had happened. And finally, after everyone was delivered, she said to me, Where you go? I said, I don't know where I go. <laughs> I was sitting watching out the windows trying to see that school. I had seen the picture of that school. <laughs> and, and finally she said, I can't drive you all day. She said, I said, well, I don't know what to do. She said, well, I go airport. I said, well, I go airport too. And she said something to him in Thai that I would understand perfectly. Now, I speak Thai very fluent, but uh, I didn't understand a word in those days. <laughs> and she said something to him. He drove one single block, turned one block to the right, and there was that school in the middle of four million people. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyhow, we arrived in a little different way than they had expected us. And finally the day came when, when they were bringing us over to the school to introduce us to the students. But I was still wearing the same clothes. The Thai people are so tiny. They weigh about, a man weighs 130 to 50 pounds. Well, my Lord, one of my legs weigh more than that. There was nothing there for me to wear. I didn't have any money to buy it if they did have it. <laughs> so we were still wearing the same outfit. <laughs> but they said, you must come and meet the school. And Mrs. Gittisan came to receive us, and she picked us up in this little Morris Minor car. Now, I don't know if you know what that is or not, but it is a car that's smaller than a Volkswagen. And she not only wanted me to get in it, but she wanted me to get in the back seat. And it was only two doors. <laughs> so I tried. <laughs> I had the door open, you know, and the seat pushed up, Brother Tim. <laughs> and I was trying to get in. And I heard something go rip. And I got in and sit down, and my wife got in and sit down beside me. She had heard it also. And she was as pale as a ghost. She wouldn't even look at me. But she said, did they? I said, yeah. I said, when I get out of this tin can, if I can get out, I want you to walk very close behind me. <laughs> Yay. And so when we arrived, when we arrived, here is 2,000 kids standing at attention, waiting for the VIP to arrive. <laughs> And when I started coming out of that Morris Minor car, those kids went absolutely bananas. They had never seen anything so huge in all of their life. I'm sure they was quite sure that I was from Mars or somewhere. <laughs> they had never seen anything like me. And one kid got so carried away, he got down on his knees and beat the ground. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> we were taking this tour, and Sister Cole right behind me. And finally, I said to Mrs. Gittisan, I have a problem. She says, what is your problem? <laughs>
I said, I have split my pants. She took me by the arms and turned me around and said, let me see. When I would walk down the streets, the people would be so astounded by my size that whatever the kids were doing or whatever, they would stop playing and run in the house and get their parents. And they would all run out and see me. I could not speak their language. I knew nothing about them. I looked like a strange person to them. I looked like some kind of a clown to them. I had nothing. But God had sent me. And God's holy anointing was upon me. And just in a few years, I baptized over 5,000 Buddhist people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Praise be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Today, there are over 16,000 members in our churches in Thailand. I want you to know that God is able to touch us and we're able to do that which is not natural or normal God can help us to rise into the dimension of the supernatural and to accomplish his precious holy will praise be the name of the Lord God Almighty those cows I must be very brief I'm taking entirely too much time. I have already spoken to you for almost an hour and I am sorry. I will hurry. Let me briefly bring you some points. The very vital points. These cows were walking a new road. A road that they had never been on before in all of their life. And when God speaks to you and challenges you and touches you and commissions you and gives you direction it is very possible that you'll have to go in a direction that is totally unfamiliar to you completely totally unfamiliar what you have to do to, to, to is to watch your faith don't let your faith ever waver in the call of God I could speak many hours in seminars on these three points but let me just mention these three points that will affect your faith one is the lack of preparation or education sometimes we're not fully prepared for the position that we are thrust into the thing to do is simply ask somebody be humble say I don't know how to do this and someone will help you can you say amen and secondly the lack of familiarity or experience. There's only one way to get experience, and that's just to jump in and try to swim. Just try it. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to break dishes. Something's going to happen. But sooner or later, you'll learn through experience. Watch this third point, and that is the lack of recognition. For some leaders, it is extremely difficult for them ever to pat you on the back and say you're doing a good job let me tell you for every person that fails because of being exalted ten fail from discouragement for everyone that we would have puffed up with that kind of a program we destroy with discouragement nine others everybody needs to know you're doing a good job everybody needs a little pat on the back once in a while Everybody needs that. I don't care who you are or how high you are. Amen. Or how experienced you are. But people sometimes don't get it. Let me give you a little secret. Let me give you a word of wisdom. Do what you do as unto the Lord. And if men or women do not recognize the good that you are doing, God does. And He will not forget what you have done. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. These cows took the straight way to Beth Shemesh. The Bible says, neither turning to the left nor the right hand. We are living in a very sinful 
world today. And it is a difficult thing to preach a message of righteousness in the world that you and I live today. There was a time when everybody believed the Bible. There was a time when everybody dressed modestly. Those days are forever gone. But we will not change our message even though this is a sinful world. Can you say amen? And we must set our eyes on the gold of what is the will of God. And when the world pulls upon us as if it's going to tear the flesh right off of your bones, we are going to resist and keep our eyes on the goal. We will go straight. The Bible says those cows were lowing as they went. They were feeling pain. They could hear their little calves bawling in the barn. And though they were doing the perfect will of God, they themselves were hurting. They were hurting. And I don't care how rich you are, and it's perfectly all right to be rich as long as you are liberal, liberal with the people of God. I don't care how fine a home you live in, if you drive a luxury car and wear tailor-made clothes and eat the finest of food, I promise you, if you ever fully accomplish the will of God in your life, someplace, somewhere, you will feel pain. And a lot of it. Lowing as they went. Amen. And the ark came into the, the area of Israel. And they seen this strange sight coming. Two cows running down the road, pulling a cart with no man on the cart to direct them or no one leading them. I, if I had time, I could make this very vivid, but I don't have time. So just let me say. The Bible says they rejoiced when they finally seen that the cargo of that cart was the Ark of the Covenant, the very symbol of the presence of the Lord. And it had miraculously come back into their presence and into their possession. Amen. And the Bible says they rejoice to see it. And maybe the musician would come to prepare to speak, play softly as I close. You have been faithful. And let me promise you this. If you continue to be faithful, there will be those in eternity that will rejoice forever. But let me also make you another promise. If you fail, if you fail, I promise you, for every single one of you that fail, there will be somebody, probably the one that you love the most, will be lost and weep for eternity if you fail. Because the one you take down first is the one that is the closest to you. We have got to seek out the will of God. I'm doing the best that I can. My education, my abilities, and my talents are almost nothing compared to the young men and the young women that we have coming on today. You're going to have a hard time matching me because there's one thing I have done. I have done my best.